Hi guys, welcome back to Wildebeard Reviews and welcome back to the Rewind Review series here on the channel where we're going through Supreme Power. Today we're on to issue 6, which might be one of the most dense, story-packed issues we've done in this series thus far. There's a ton of stuff to unpack in this one and there's a bunch of conversations to be had. Um, this is uh, issue 6 and this is an 18 issue uh, uh, run on this series, so we're, we're about halfway th or a third of the way through this particular story. So the way I kind of like in this is it's the end of the first act, right? If you're talking about story structure and how movies typically work, we're at the end of the first act. So it kind of feels like we've we've done all our, all our world building. We're introduced to all of the main players um, in in our story here. We're at the top of our roller coaster, right? We've, we've ratcheted up and we're about to fall off and have uh, Act Two kick off in issues seven uh, through twelve, and then Act Three will be um, thirteen through eighteen. So let's go ahead and start diving into this one because like I said there is a ton of stuff to go through in in this particular issue and it has one of the most interesting single pages I think I've ever um, gone over in in a particular comic book all right questions of perspective and that's that's definitely something that's going on um, in this one all right so here we go we open up with Stanley giving a press conference now that he has uh, officially sponsored by um, this coca-cola brand or whatever it was uh, it says here uh, speed of action speed of endeavor speed of thought so it only seems appropriate that uh, Bryce racing systems sorry it's a racing uh, company doing his suit not the the cola from last issue uh, and uh, Intex systems should be the first corporations to sponsor Gareth and Henderson's star client Stanley Stewart in addition to the seven-figure advance uh, advertising revenue our sponsors have pooled their resources to design a special racing suit for Stanley that like many Many other products features a sleek aerodynamic design that allows for proper airflow, foot traction, and heat distribution, and uh, also say a, a computerized cooling system that maintains its body temperature at a perfect 98.7 degrees. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the man, the legend, the blur, Stanley Stewart. So his kind of official presentation to the public at large in his sleek racing suit there. He, he uh, Stanley or the Blair steps up and says, I just want to thank everyone for all their support to the guys at Bryce and Intex System for the cool outfit to my mom who's been watching me uh, on a brand new TV at home. Hey mom, check it out. I mean, you guys have no idea what it's like to be running down uh, the street and have your clothes burst into flame all the time. If any of you uh, got soot in your eyes coming over here today, it might be some of last week's underwear. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, and then. Something that flies by and everyone's like, what was that? And whatever it was, it says, meet me two miles. And they're like, what was that? Stanley, did you see anything? And we see that it was Hyperion flying by saying, meet me two miles down the road in an hour. I'll be at some place, right? And he says, nope, uh, that, that must have just been the wind. Anyway, I, I was telling you about my mom just kind of continues on. And so Hyperion and Stanley have a great remark and Stanley Mark and Stanley, Hyperion, and the Blur. There we go. Let's get our our, our, uh, our uh, uh, <laughs> unofficial names and then our code names uh, uh, properly aligned there. So they start having a very, very poignant conversation, right? They just starting to be and said, "Hey, you know what's going on? How you doing?" Um, and then Hyperion says, "Hey, why, why'd you run away that that day that when I first saw you?" And he says, "I, I wasn't ready to talk to anybody about it yet." Um, and then he, Hyperion says, "Then why were you running all over Georgia every couple of days? Even blurred by speed, you must have known sooner or later someone was going to get a picture of you." And uh, Stanley says, "Yeah, I knew it was a risk, but I couldn't not do it. You know, I mean, uh, knowing what I can do, how fast I can run, it's just I'd sit, stand at home sitting around. I'd gone nuts. It's the need for speed, the." urge to merge you know just hitting the open road and going flat out but you know what it's like hell other one other than me no one else does and that is another key line they're finding some camaraderie here because to their knowledge they're the only two powered 
people on the planet. Uh, and Hyperion says, yeah, I do. When I was growing up, I found out uh, I could fly before I even told anybody about it. The first time I ever did it, the first time you have no idea. I used to fly around my room at night, and then I eventually went outside and decided to see um, how high I could go or how far I could go. And he left Earth and went up into orbit. You see how far away he is uh, right there in this flashback, putting his hand over the Earth, trying to get that perspective. Uh, Stanley asks him, how far did he, did he get? And Mark kind of looks over, looks away, and says, "You know, not very." Kind of hiding how how really powerful he is. And then this is one of the most important questions in in this book, I think. And then uh, because it sets the tone for what I think is going to be the rest of Mark's story throughout this this series, Stanley asks him, "What do you do?" And he, Mark's like, I, I, I don't know if you understand the question. He's saying, I'm saying, what do you do? Like today, what did you do today? And he says, well, I, on the way over here, I saved people from a fire, saved a train, um, saved some, and then other stuff. And he's like, no, no, that's what you did. You played hero. That's great. But what do you do? Look, everyone's got a goal, a dream, something they're working toward. But you've got to have plans, man, plans and goals and ideas. You ever see one of those English border collies fast, strong, smarter than any other dog on the planet? But you've got to keep them busy. You've got to give them homework and projects and goals. I knew a guy had one. It didn't keep its mind occupied. And over the summer, it took apart his front porch with its bare teeth, bored by board. You don't give a dog something like that, like that, something to do, uh, a problem to solve. It'll go crazy. And the last thing the world needs is someone like you going crazy. You understand? Whew. There's a lot to unpack there. So this is kind of the the question, the 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 topic. What the, the Stanley asking Mark this question is what I think pushes us from Act One into Act Two, and we'll see what what Mark goes through in the rest of this issue. That kind of helps put him, uh, kind of helps him decide what he's going to do because he's challenged here. He doesn't have an answer to this question. He's just right now he's the government's puppet, and he doesn't know how to do what he wants to do. He doesn't have his own goals. Everything that he's been and had laid out before him um, up to this point is what the government wants him to do. There, he's their their gun is that that they point and you know they shoot him at whatever the problem is, and now they're parading him around like a hero and just say, hey, go 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 help people, like he was talking about here, you know, saving people from a fire or a derailing train, you know, stuff like that. Now he has been confronted with the opportunity or the um the idea that he doesn't know what he wants to do for himself. It's like you know, once you get out of uh, high school or college, you've you know got you know what maybe your parents have always wanted for you but then you have to decide if that's really what you want for yourself or if you want to go a different path and that's where mark is right here and it's fascinating really really cool stuff he says, uh, uh, and then they kind of uh, diverge away from that. Mark asks, where did you come from? Where did you get your abilities? Asking that of Stanley. And he says, I don't know, man. Mom says uh, there's never been anyone in the family like me. I was born the same as everyone. Uh, I got real sick for a while when I was small, almost died. But aside from that, nothing unusual. So as far as he knows, he's just a you know, kid born with special powers. May as well be a, a mutant if we're in a, a, adjacent to, to, to the Marvel Universe. Um, he says, I always figured I was just a big jump in evolution. Again, kind of maybe mutant him. Uh, says my mom uh, said it was the hand of God that thought I was the only one until you came along. And Mark says the government told everyone my natural parents died in a plane crash right after I was born. They said that they wanted to protect the privacy of my real parents who raised me, but there are times I wonder. And then he's having memories of him being in that pod, not being of Earth combined with him being able to fly out into space and be just fine, starting to question who he really is. So starting to question who he really is, starting to question who his own, uh, what his motivations are and why he has those motivations. So this is where we're starting to get this character arc for uh, for uh, the main uh, Mark character here. So he basically says it's a relief to know that there's, uh, there's someone else and then they kind of split up, and he says, uh, the blur tells him, he's like, uh, if you ever want to talk, you know you know where to find me. Guys like us got to find um, uh, somebody to talk to. And they say, um, he says, uh, he mentions to him that there's someone else up in Chicago called Nighthawk, or he thinks they're called Nighthawk. He's like, might be an urban legend, but uh, when, but then again, that's what they said about me, you know. And so now he's like, all right, I'm, I'm going to go up to Chicago and, and find this guy. 
All right, so now here we go back to the, the program runners, and they're doing some investigation on the pod that brought Hyperion to Earth, and uh, this tech noticed some uh, very, very small, like only five microns wide, little notches in the ship, little gaps where something could be held, and they find out that there was something in there that uh, w w there was something in there when Hyperion came to Earth, and they're only wide enough for like some sort of bacterium or virus or, or something like that and so now they're going to try and uh, do some more research on it to figure out what was in there now my theory on this is that maybe um, the, the what was in there is what gave everyone else uh, the rest of our kind of ju Justice League analogs here their powers so um, we we were just talking about um, with with Stanley how he was a baby and was sick and almost died or a kid or something like that and he got he got better and maybe it was one of these bacteria or a virus or something like that that left the ship and healed him and then maybe that's also why um, the baby that um, was kind of our, our Aquaman character um, was there well it doesn't quite explain the Wonder Woman character that's supposed to have been there for for centuries but we haven't seen much of that character so we'll see where that goes I could just be grasping at straws and I'm sure if you guys have uh, have already read ahead of me then you know where I'm going or you know where the story is going and I don't so don't tell me down in the comments I prefer to, to be surprised all right and so they're just continuing their conversation here, and one of them says, uh, so, Perio, so Hyperion, uh, after all, may uh, might have been just a distraction from what they say. It depends. It depends on how many viruses, microbes, bacteria were in those compartments and what they were designed for, and how many alien life forms of whatever size can, center, uh, can enter an ecosystem before you start calling it an invasion. Uh, either way, I don't think I'm going to get much sleep tonight. So Bill, the program leader, is um, here at his house turns off the light and something is flying into his house and it is Dr. Spectrum and Joe Ledger and he is none too happy about something. You can see all of his speech bubbles here are bolded and they are all in caps, which actually it's usually, comics are usually I believe have most of their dialogue in caps, but this one is uh, you know, it's just like regular English, it's uh, lowercase for the most part, just standard grammar rules so it's interesting that, you know, that, that helps it make stand out here and he says what have you done to me? Now here in a minute, um, well, the, the doctor's like i don't know what you're talking about please god just um I, I don't know what happened we didn't we didn't know this was going to happen please forgive me and joe here says why not look at you i can do anything i want to you to any of you and then over here on the next page joe kind of snaps out of it he continues and he says uh, ever since i awoke i've been learning 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 everything from every broadcast every phone call every word there's not one of you who deserves mercy not one of you deserves consideration then he stops for a second and then the speech bubbles go back to normal, but you can also see his eyes. Uh, I don't know if my camera will pick this up clean enough for you guys to see, but his eyes go back to a normal color where over here, his eyes were basically whited out or almost grayed out, and that's how they looked when he awoke back in the last issue. So clearly, this crystal or something about this crystal is is taking him over. And he said, he's talking to, the, to, to Bill here, and he says, Hey, Bill, funny, I was... I was just thinking about you. How's it going? And Bill's like, uh, you're, uh, you're looking kind of, you're, one, you're naked. That's why there's a post-it note on that page. And he says, uh, I'm fine, Joe. I'm good. How about you? And he says, you know, not bad. Just woke up. That was some trip you boys sent me on, but I feel good. You're just like, okay, something is, something is up with this. And then, um, here we go to Nighthawk. And I think this is one of the most, I think this one of the pages over here is one of the most single interesting pages in this entire comic. Maybe one of the most interesting pages I've seen in a while. So they're in uh, Chicago and we see this church being vandalized by a bunch of racists. They're spray painting uh, a racial epithet on this church and it's uh, a black church. So that should tell you what kind of thing they are spray painting on that. I'm not going to say it on this channel. All right, so um, he, a Nighthawk is sitting on, standing up here watching the the vandals, and then all of a sudden he's got Hyperion's chest symbol there in his, in his vision, and he says, Hey, 
how's it going? And he confronts him. He says, uh, a friend told me I should take a look around Chicago, said I might find something interesting. That would be you. It's Nighthawk, right? Uh, I'm Mark. They call me Hyperion, but really it's just Mark. Busy down there, aren't they? They're not exactly a part of the American dream, that's for sure. I've been following you most of the night. It's easy when I can get higher than you, and I noticed a couple of things. First, every time you intervene to help people, uh, to help people out, the people you were protecting were always African American, and the ones doing the attacking were Caucasians. Uh, but just down the street from one attack, a young Caucasian woman was being jumped by a Hispanic gang, and an Asian grocer was being harassed by a bunch of street punks. Since you were busy and I was in the neighborhood, I took care of it. Which brings me to the second thing, and this is the most interesting page I think I've seen in, in a while. We'll break this down almost frame by frame. So this one on the top here, you can see just the normal background. He says, uh, from the way you climbed and fought and ran uh, and jumped, there's nothing special about you, is there? Um, there, uh, Which isn't to say that we're not all special in our own way, right? Right? It's not, I mean, no powers, just training. So he's already kind of pegged him as just a baseline human, no powers or anything. But that, that saying, like, there's nothing special about you, could be conceived or construed as an attack. Now, the whole page here, he's just continuing to almost give this lecture um, to, to, to Nighthawk here. But this one, Nighthawk is kind of seeing him as a clan member. You can see the hood there, and you see it over here, and you see someone has been, been hanged here. And he says, um, I have an advantage because of the way I was born uh, that not a lot of other people have. And sometimes people get the wrong idea that they can do the same thing I can do just because they decided. If I hear about one more kid breaking a leg because he thought he could fly, well, we all have to know uh, our relative positions in life. I'd hate for my work to give people the wrong ideas about what they can do or become. There are limits. But I respect your goals. I respect your bravery. I could look. Um, I could try to look through your mask and see who you, who you are, but I won't because my flash vision isn't as precise as I'd like, and I might risk uh, setting your face on fire. So that that last little bit is just kind of funny. It's like I'd see who you are, but I don't think my mask, my my vision's uh, tuned in enough to do it. But it's really this paragraph right here. He says, "I have an advantage because of the way I was born," and now that line. Without con like without just context, that line just in a vacuum against this background of art, you could very clearly see that someone was you know a, a white supremacist there, and this the whole page is Nighthawk trying to figure out what um, what Hyperion is right. So he says something. It's like hey, that kind of sounds a little white supremacisty, and then he goes you know maybe not. Uh, Hyperion says, uh, but I really have to ask, are you really any different than those guys? down there if you only help out one group of people isn't that a form of racism isn't that isn't it better to help out all people in need simply because they are in need because we can help isn't that what this country is supposed to be all about now i realize this was written years ago i think this was like mid 2000s but man that right there just reads like it should have uh, hashtag all lives matter right underneath it right he says but I have to ask if you're only focused on one uh, group of people isn't that a form of racism and that's that's kind of the whole argument that's going on you know right now it's like you know everyone has their own problems but right now one group of people is going through a lot more than the rest so so they need our help and so he's Mark's trying to kind of reconcile that trying to to figure that out and I'm sorry if I say substance too but I'm not a I'm just a guy trying to talk about comic books. Um, then the next one, um, it says, Welcome, Bleeding Heart Liberals. So kind of seeing the other side of the fence, right? So Mark is saying, I always try to be colorblind to these things. I have a gift, and my folks uh, taught me that this gift should be shared with all Americans, regardless of color, creed, or religion. I think the world is a happier place if you try to look at it with colorblind eyes. Now, I think he's seeing this one here. It's also funny that it's a red hat. Again, it was written year, written and drawn years and years and years ago before our current political climate, but I think what he's seeing here is like, is this a guy that's so um, hardcore, like, anti-racist that he ends up becoming racist himself? Like, he 
completes the circle like he's oh I'm colorblind oh don't see you know but it ends up kind of coming back around just trying to kind of peg where where Mark is because uh, Nighthawk is because of his history because his family was killed as part of a hate crime um, we've seen that he kind of sees the world um, that's that's the way he sees the world everything is another potential one of those that's clearly what he's stopping with with what Mark sees over here um, and then he continues on if my presence in this world has inspired you to do things to take action to live bravely and to help people then I would ask you to follow through and help all people who find uh, you are in need so he's basically saying it's like look if you're a hero you need to be a hero and help out every situation um, that you come across and then he, the next one is him like being from Mars which I thought was hilarious and uh, Hyperion says uh, try to look at the world as if you were outside it all as one big planet without borders or nationalities. Sometimes I think that only someone who was truly an alien could solve all the world's problems because only an alien could be objective enough to get the job done. So he's kind of outing himself as an alien here. He's saying like, look, we are so mired in our own stuff here on the planet Earth that maybe it would take a neutral third party or a neutral party from out among the stars, someone that's not of this Earth to kind of come in and be able to objectively look at everything that's going on and give us a plan to fix it. And so um, Nighthawk sees as him as if he um, coming from Mars here, right? He continues on. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that because I think you're trying to be a, uh, trying to do as well intentioned, but you need to broaden your horizons a bit. He says. So, do you have anything to say? Uh, and then Nighthawk says, uh, "Yeah, I point out that you haven't done shit to stop those guys down there from doing what they're doing." And Mark just kind of looks back and says, mm, "Yeah, uh, I never try to get between a professional and his work. Have a good night." And then he flies off, and Nighthawk just calls him a prick, and then goes in and beats up on the guys um vandalizing the church in a very uh brutal brutal way as we can tell here and i love the um the uh the stained glass here looking at him really good stuff um he says here uh yeah i got your color blindness right here as he punches the the stained glass all right so then we got um joe waking up in in the hospital and saw and that bill is telling him a first rule of, th of thumb humpty dumpty notwithstanding is that if we break something even if it's our fault we can always find a way to to put it back together again. Obviously something went amiss when we tried to bring you out of the coma, but the important thing is that you are awake and you're you're out and you're awake and alive. Everything else is negotiable. So basically they're trying to say, um, we don't know how to get that thing off you. It's bonded to you at a molecular level. Basically we would the only way we know how to get it off for sure is to just cut the hand off and that's that's not a, a solution um, for anybody. And so um and so then, and Bill here is basically remembering how he was kind of had a weird split personality. And he's like, was I talking to, to Corporal Ledger or was I talking to the ship? Because that crystal was like the power source for the ship. So we'll see, we'll see where that one goes. But here we get um, the more interesting bit, right? So Hyperion flies out to, to into space outside of Earth again. And he's remembering that conversation he had with the blur or he's re remembering what he said try to look at the world as if you were outside it outside it all one big plant without borders or nationalities sometimes i think that only one that the only one that only that someone who was truly alien could solve all the world's problems because only an alien could be object objective enough to get the world done then he remembers the blur's question you don't give a dog um like that something important to do a problem to solve it goes crazy and the last thing you and the world needs is someone like you going crazy so we have this great moment of realization here for um for hyperion i think that's it yeah we got issue uh seven coming up next so we have this great moment of realization for him he realizes that he doesn't have uh, a guiding principle that's his own he only has what the government has given him um when he has that conversation with the blur then he goes to nighthawk and he kind of says hey look some uh, you know i see you're only helping a certain segment of people as heroes i think we're supposed to help everyone and then he kind of bemoans 
groans and thinks about, you know, I think the, the only way we're going to get some real change around here is if we see someone that is outside of everything, someone that can take a look, take a step back and look at the entire picture and, you know, judge us uh, without borders, without nationalities, without any of that crap that comes with being a human and being born and raised in this on this planet. And then he kind of puts two and two together, makes four, and now I think that's where Hyperion is going to go from here. He has an idea of what he needs to do, and he knows that he is an outsider. Probably, he probably suspects that he's an outsider to all of this, so he's going to try to be the one that fixes it. Whether or not that goes right is left up for the next 12 issues in this series. So that's where we're going to leave this one off, and we'll be back with issue 7 in another video. So guys, what did you think of issue 6 of, Pro of uh, Supreme Power? It's one of my favorite issues uh, thus far. It has some big, heady things to talk about. I love the way they play with the art um, uh, with the, in that one page with um, with Nighthawk trying to figure out Mark I love that the idea of the blur asking Mark what he's um, what he's what do you do like how do you like what's your you know uh, major tenants as a superhero what are you trying to do and then Mark kind of self realizing that answer later on when he sees an example of what he doesn't think a hero is and now here we are so a great first act great first six issues to what I hope is another uh, great 12 issues issues but we'll wait and see that for another day guys thank you so much for watching if it's your first time here at the channel and you liked what we talk about go ahead and hit that subscribe button before you click away uh, if you want to support the channel even more than that down in the description box down below is my patreon and an ask me anything tip page if you want to leave a monetary tip to the channel as long uh, or as well as a question or topic i'll address that topic or question here on the channel in a standalone video uh, other than that i got my uh, p.o box my email address and all my social media is down there if you want to reach out to me there. Once again, thank you so much for watching and until next time, we'll see you at the comic shop.